All right, welcome back to the Midwest Dream Car Collection. Today we have with us Eric Artzer. Eric is one of our longtime volunteers since we opened up the museum. He's also on our research advisory team here and, and helped us do a lot of the research on a lot of these cars uh, before we even opened up. And Eric has a fascination with Volkswagens and obviously Model A's. And so I'm just gonna let Eric talk to you a little bit about uh, his car here today. And uh, Eric, why don't you tell us a little bit on how you found this car, how this car came to be in your family. This car is a family car. My dad was a big Model A enthusiast. Um, he had three cars and got to the point where he decided it was time to pass them along. He had a Model A Roadster, a Model A pickup, and he had this 31 Victoria. The Victoria came out of an estate in Texas in the uh, late 90s. The fella that he purchased it from had uh, restored it in 73 and 74 and shown it nationally on the American Automobile Club or Automobile Club of America um, and it won national recognition there. The car today and as he found it uh, 20 plus years ago is largely remained untouched. The paint and the top and interior were done in 73, 74 and haven't been done since. Some mechanical touches obviously have been done, tires and tune-ups and a few of those things to keep it what it is. So. Well, it's a really snazzy car, especially for 1931. For a Ford product, you know, you'd expect something like this in the Packards and in the more upscale vehicles, but in the Ford, this was pretty uh, top of the line. So why don't you just go around and talk a little bit about your car here and and kind of what makes it a Victoria compared to regular Model A and, and whatever you want to talk about and share with us. So okay. wherever you want to start okay. on it, Eric. Well, let's start on the outside and talk about what the distinguishing features are of a Model A Victoria over a two-door sedan. Um, production numbers were pretty low for the Victoria. They were built mid-30 through late 31. Uh, Model A started in late 27 and ran through 32. They produced about four and a half million Model A's and they had a little over two dozen different body styles. So there was quite a few offerings there. The Victoria's numbers were about 40,000 cars. So they were less than 1% of the total of the cars manufactured. What makes it a Victoria is it's Wheelbase is the same, but it's considered a Victoria Coupe. The 190A is what the production numbers are. They all had what Ford referred to as the bustle, the little step in the back trunk. They were also visorless. All the Model A's carried an eyebrow, carried a visor. The Victoria did not. Some of the different four-door sedans may have not too. That may be my pitfall in information. They were also a slanted windshield. The Victorias offered a little bit longer door, which helped gain access, made access to the car a little easier. Um, Victorias were a little upscale. They did cost an extra hundred dollars over the two-door sedan, and they offered some different features that were a little more plush. The fold-up, fold-away seats that made access to the rear a little easier. Let me step around to the other side and I'll open that door. They also had a drop down rear floor, which gave for more leg room. The back seat rest folds forward. It's a little stiff, but it allows for a little luggage story, storage. A little so luggage. Like that bustle back does allow a little extra storage. A little back extra there. storage in that back bustle. Had the rear armrests that were swooping, a little more form fitting. It had the pull down blinds on the windows, on the rear windows. It had a passenger assist uh, cords or pulls to help get out of the rear of the car. The Victoria also had. Uh, sun visors on the inside, which was unique to this feet, this model of the Model A. I never noticed those up there before. You just don't see those on uh, that period of car, do you? That period of car. And they're, they're really kind of uh, awkward in their positioning from what you're used to because they fold back so close to your face as opposed to 
out against the windshield. This is um, a mohair interior, which was not unusual for the time. They had a couple of different interior options. Um, I'm assuming that's what this one was fitted with is why it stayed that way. Has some kind of fun accessory pieces that are added on the uh, water and oil gauge are an accessory that hang below the instrument cluster. The glass world knobs were not a factory piece, but they were an accessory piece of the time. And the extension lever that helps release the emergency brake without having to reach quite so far. Well, that's pretty slick. I never noticed that on there before either. So those glass knobs were original to the time. To the frame. time, okay. correct. Model A's were a uh, toe start. They were a push button starter on the floor. This one is, let's make sure we're out of gear before we go any further. This one has an accessory, what's called an upstart. So by lifting the lever, it actuates the starter motor via connecting rod down to where the push button for the starter should be. So if it didn't have that, it would have been a pedal on the floor or a button on the floor. It would have been a small knob on the floor, which made them quite a trick to hold the brake, hold the clutch, and roll your toe over to try and find the starter button to get it to start. So, Especially since the pedals are so close together. Pedals are really close together. Um, the throttle pedal is the small round knob. The knob beside it is just a steady rest for your foot. The center knob is the light switch. It'll run the headlights, taillights, or the cowl lights. Uh, and then the center of it is the horn button. The long lever that comes up the right-hand side under uh, the right-hand side of the dash is the choke rod. And it's also the mixture adjustment on the carburetor. We'll have to look and see how that operates when we pop the hood on here a little that. bit. See how it all that. falls into place. And so then kind of standard Model A. Uh, Gauges, is that correct? With the they are. The ignition switch, the speedometer is kind of a, a fun as it, it rolls horizontally instead of a BM needle. Uh, the fuel gauge is actually a cork floated fuel gauge in the tank. The tanks on Model A's are up in the cow, so the gas tank is immediately behind uh, the instrument cluster. Rearview mirror has this an, as an accessory piece, has a wind up, a hand wound clock in the rearview mirror. Obviously, someone has forgotten to wind it in the past few years <laughs> of its idle time. So. Well, that's uh, pretty unique. This is uh, this Victoria is considered a leatherback. They had the leatherback and the steelback. The steelback was a, a solid painted top, where the leatherback had the fabric top on it applied over the steel well, body. I, then. A question: I didn't think they had vinyl, but this didn't really look like leather, so I didn't know. I, I think this is probably what was available in 1973 when it was. Okay. Done. Okay. So gotcha. They are still a so, uh, not a solid roof car. This is still wooden bows and. Uh, uh, they were generally chicken wire and horsehair padding above the wooden bows in the top. They didn't have large enough dies at the time to punch the top in one piece, so these cars were built in sections and then either welded together or welded together and covered with the padded top. And this being a Victoria that has the cloth liner headliner in it, would that have been also in the... That would have been on the two-door, four-door sedans, would have still, been the same still way. Top. This one also has the uh, dual taillights. Most of the Model A's were a single taillight. And the trunk is an accessory piece. So we have enough battery to light the taillights up. Kind of fun with the stop etched into the glass. That is cool. The car is the factory black with the tan leather top and the apple green wheels are, were a factory. Option. I wondered about that. Those are so uh, attractive really? on this car and really set it aside. I know we get asked all the time here at the museum, is that factory correct? And, and the information that I have found is it is factory correct and, and it's hand painted with the apple green pinstripe to offset the center of the car also. Now these are uh, like a parking light or driving lights. because it doesn't have directional signals, is that correct? Correct. These were just a cow light, like a running light. Let's see if we've got enough. The 
this headlight switch will bring the cow lights on in one position with the tail lights. Okay. And then one there position go. does headlights with no cow. I think it's high and low is what I'm catching there. The stone guard on the radiator is an accessory, and it does have our badge from the Automobile Club of America's placement of it. You had to have air conditioning in 31, so the windshield is on a couple eccentrics and will slide out quite a ways, but it has a notch part way down on the sliding arm that catches and holds the windshield open just a few inches. That allows the air to catch under the glass and then is pushed down behind the dash to cool your feet. Oh yeah, you can see the uh, opening in there. Right, so as that, as that windshield's closed back, it for lets more of the air go down than out and across your face. So. They were a four cylinder flathead motor, so flathead just would mean that the valves are in the block instead of in the head. They were, the change over the T was they did have a water pump, so they were actually pumping the water. They weren't a thermal siphon. I believe they are rated at 40 horsepower. Pretty um, simple under there. Simple and basic, they are. Probably tough as nails too. And fairly dependable. I, you know, I think age has probably been harder on them than anything. Uh, just age and wear over time. Yeah. They're, they're, it's kind of fun. The spark plug wires are strips of brass. I can pull one clear off. And get a better look at it. In my nice clean hands, will look good on film, I'm sure. So that's the spark plug wire. And I understand that uh, if you get too close to those with a screwdriver, it'll knock you. Or your hand, or <laughs> anything else it that bites might reach back. across there. Yeah, it's not it's not afraid to tell you good morning. So we can open Now, it. is this where the starter starters on this side came in? Mm -hmm. The two rods are the uh, rod across here ties into the bottom of the distributor. So that's the one that'll advance or retard the timing on it. And this rod links to a shaft that runs behind that'll open the uh, throttle a little wider so you can actually set the throttle speed at the steering column. So early cruise control. Yeah. Really cruise control. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at the other side. So these were an updraft carburetor. The fuel was fed via gravity. This is a sediment bowl off the back of the tank. The tank sits above in the cowl. They were gravity fed in um, and then the fuel was atomized and drawn up into the engine. They had, this one is less the air cleaner because the air cleaners tend to be a bit of a fire hazard. They trap fuel in them and when they won't start and then when they do decide to start they'll actually catch the car on fire. So <laughs> most Model A's you see choose not to run air cleaners. I can understand that. So um, the rod that's coming through the side is what we talked about earlier. This is the, the choke rod and then it also rotates which uh, adjusts the fuel mixture. Very so nice. Pretty simple. This Victoria, some of the Victoria uh, seem to be um, were rear spares. This one has the accessory trunk on the back. So this one without the rear spare also has the dual side mounts, which was more of the Fayette and Victoria line that did that. The more upscale of the Model A's would end up with the dual, the dual side mounts. My dad was pretty adamant that he was uh, wanting to restore and repaint it. And several of his friends said, you have to leave it alone, you have to leave it alone. And, and it, I really think it shows very well 
being left alone. You know, it, it has its uh, badges of honor of time, so. I agree. Well, Eric, thanks for sharing your car with us today sure. and the sure. story behind it. And we've enjoyed having it here at the museum. And it, It's and nice that it can be somewhere that everyone can come to enjoy it. I, I, I love my cars and sometimes I spend too much time alone in the garage and should be out where everyone can enjoy them a little more. So this is, this is a great place to be able to bring it out and show it.